Maybe I'll use this. Hello. Um, I think we're ready to start, so please find your seat. Um, thank, you for, thank you very much for coming to the uh, IMA public lecture. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Michael Trick. This is sort of a homecoming for Michael. He was a uh, postdoc here about 22 years ago. He, in fact, he was a postdoc at the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications. From there, he went to uh, Carnegie Mellon, where he's now a uh, professor in the Tepper School of Business, and he's a full professor. Aside from his academic appointment, he is also a partner in Sports Scheduling Group, which is a company that uh, provides schedules for major sport franchises. So he's going to talk about some of this at the, today's talk. Um, he's, he also served as the president of the Carnegie Bosch Institute for Applied Studies in International Management at Carnegie Mellon from 1998 to 2005. Uh, in 2002, Michael was elected uh, president of an operations research professional society called INFORMS. This is an or a huge organization with about 14,000 members. Uh, he's currently vice president of the International Federations of Operations Research Societies, which is an umbrella organization for operations research um, uh, professional organizations. So Michael's research interests are in discrete math and its applications to problems from manufacturing, distribution, and logistics. Uh, Michael has received numerous recognition for his good work. Uh, he recently received a, a Hood Fellowship from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, he's won numerous teaching awards, including the George Leland Bach Teaching Award at Carnegie Mellon. He was elected fellow by uh, the professional society which he served uh, as president in forms. And early in his career, he uh, received an uh, Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award, which is a very competitive award for people with freshly out of their PhD. Uh, one more thing about Michael. He's a very diligent blogger. He has a, a Michael Trick blog, uh, uh, operations research blog, which uh, has been in existence since 2005. It's uh, very heavily visited by people like me trying to find out what he's doing, and I think he's going to be tutoring very soon, right? <laughs> His work uh, is about using mathematics to make better de decisions, and he, which he will illustrate tonight in his talk. So please welcome Michael. Thank you. I bet you it's working now. Good. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I do have the world's most read operations research blog. It's kind of like being the world's tallest midget. It's not a very competitive sport, but uh, you know, if you do get a chance to check it out, I, it does give you a bit about the world of operations research. Um, so I am delighted to be back here at the University of Minnesota. Um, uh, just a, a bit of background. I, I, I had a fantastic year when I was here. I was a postdoctoral fellow. Um, uh, during the special year on applied combinatorics. For those of you who uh, were here 22 years ago, you might not recognize me, so I thought I'd give you a picture of what I looked like back then. Um, I, I'll point out that that tie was never in style. Okay, don't get the idea that it, back in 1987, that's the way people should have dressed. So um, I do note that that tie is in the back of my closet in case the world ever goes completely insane and goes with that tie again. So um, what I want to do today is I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you about how I got involved with scheduling Major League Baseball uh, and some interesting side effects that, that came out of that. Um, then we're going to look at a schedule. We're going to try to think about what goes into a schedule. What sort of constraints, what sort of issues go into a schedule? What makes a good schedule? And what would be a bad schedule? Um, and then we're going to go into my field, operations research. And I'm going to try to explain a bit about how traditional operations research would have approached this problem. And by traditional, I mean stuff including up to and through the time I was a postdoc here 22 years ago, um, and why it doesn't work. And then I'm going to try to tell you about some exciting things that have happened in the last 15 years that have really made things much more powerful and uh, really advanced our ability to solve some of these problems. Uh, and then I'm going to come back to that story. So let me begin with the story. The story begins with baseball. OK, now, I know you have a nice baseball stadium here. 
but that's a butte. Okay, that's PNC Park in Pittsburgh. And uh, as you can see, we have downtown in the background, we have the river. It's outdoors, which I think is a nice thing. Um, and as I, I hope most of you know, baseball is a big part of American culture. It's a big part of American life. There is nothing like going out to a baseball game on a nice warm afternoon. You have got your family with you. You watch the Pirates lose again. It's a wonderful, wonderful day. <laughs> Not this year. We're going to win this year. Trust, mark these words. Now, um, I've been a baseball fan all my life. I've enjoyed baseball very much. If I had been given my four-hour slot like I had asked, I could tell you about the time I caught a foul ball from Gary Gaetti uh, over in the Metrodome. But I don't have three hours to go through the details. So I will simply say baseball is a big part. Now, I teach MBA students. And the Tepper School works very hard to keep the technical prowess of its MBAs high. And so I teach them serious operations research. Now, the story of about how I got involved in Major League Baseball actually goes back to some of those MBA students and that place, which is my local bar. Um, so I'll point out, I teach MBA students. They're all in their late 20s. And so I took them out for drinks after class one day. And so 70 of us piled into that little place. <laughs> and um, as I was rotating through and people were drinking on my tab, one of the uh, students asked me, you know, how would you take all this wonderful stuff we've been learning about operations research and use it to create a schedule for Major League Baseball? And I said, well, you know, this would all be very easy, OK? Um, we've learned about integer programming. We could do integer programming. If all else failed, we've been learning about some heuristic approaches, rules of thumb that get you good things. Clearly, I'd do a great job at that. That was 1996. About two months after that conversation, I got a phone call from this man, Doug Bierman, uh, the guy on the right, uh, who asked, I think we should, or said, we should work at scheduling Major League Baseball. Um, he had been in baseball for many, many years, and um, he had been on the scheduling committee. He knew a lot about what baseball was looking for in a schedule. What he didn't know, of course, was anything about mathematics and operations research. And so he correctly deduced that if he wanted to be successful, he had to know some mathematics, okay? Or he had to find somebody who did. And so 1996, Doug and I, got together in order to try to uh, schedule Major League Baseball. Our competition, Henry and Holly Stevenson. OK, there's Henry and Holly. Um, they've been schedulers. OK, now I, I have different information. Um, they live somewhere on the East Coast, and they've been scheduling since the early 80s, I think are the only true facts I can actually attest to. There are some things that may or may not be correct. In any case, they've been scheduling for 15, 20 years, and I don't know what they do. I have read articles. Uh, there's a uh, Sports Illustrated article from about 1986 that referred to them as young computer programmers. But my belief is they don't do operations research. Um, I certainly, uh, they don't publish in that uh, realm. Um, and some of the things that I can see in their schedule suggest a fair amount of hand scheduling. Now, part of the issue, then, is how well do they do? Could we do any better? Well, 1996, I knew integer programming, heuristics. I was going to kill them. Oop. 2005. It took a little while, <laughs> a little longer than I might have expected. But in 2005, it finally happened. From Sports Illustrated, matchmakers versus the machine. I'm the machine. <laughs> okay, uh, for Holly and Henry Stevenson, this year's baseball playoffs brought bad news. They lost their spots on Major League's roster. For the last 23 seasons, the Stevensons had scheduled the national pastime. Here they say Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. Uh, there are other articles that put them in different places. Of course, they can well move. Um, but uh, baseball is set to approve a 2005 schedule produced by a team from Carnegie Mellon, Georgia Tech, and the sports scheduling group. Uh, it was wonderful. I was so happy. I, I sat reading this article with my, my wife in 
our newly renovated kitchen, paid for from Major League Baseball. <laughs> and we read this article, and my wife looked at me lovingly and said, I feel so sorry for Henry and Holly. <laughs> OK, well, I guess you can't win. OK, so we're set. Um, two, why, I mean, why did we finally win it after eight years? Well, a number of things had happened. Um, but basically, our schedules were better. Okay, it took a fair amount of time for me to advance the mathematics, and we'll be talking about the mathematics in a little bit. It took a while, but finally I could, in a reasonable amount of time, get the computer to spit out schedules that were better. Now, this is great news. Baseball is now using operations research to create its schedules. 2008 rolls around for the 2008 schedule. I am living in New Zealand in 2007, which is when this schedule is to be created. I am on a beach with my lovely son, Alexander, three years old, my wife, ever suffering, Alona, who um, we're having a fine time in New Zealand, and we get the news. Baseball doesn't need us anymore. Okay? Baseball bought into this idea of operation so strongly that they were going to do it internally. Okay. So, that's the start of the story. So I'll get back to the rest of the story at the end. It's got a happy ending, so <laughs> we'll continue this. So before I get too deep in this, um, let me say a few words about why sports scheduling. Um, sports scheduling looks a little recreational. It doesn't look like one could actually have a reasonable research career if one is talking about how you know to play games. Well, in fact, sports, sports is big business. Okay? Major League Baseball is a multi-billion dollar industry. They get $500 million a year from the US national TV to televise their games. College uh, basketball conferences get up to $30 million a year. Um, Manchester United. Uh, just to, for the Europeans in the audience, privatized for 800 uh, million pounds and gets more than 15 million pounds in sponsorship per year. Nobody wants to spend that amount of money and have a bad schedule to play. And we'll, we'll look at a schedule, and there are good schedules and bad schedules. If you are a rights holder who has got a game of the week you really want to have a good game of the week. You've spent millions for that game. You do not want to have a motley collection to choose from. Now, from a research point of view, it's also wonderful because I, the, there's a huge number of problems here. I am talking today about scheduling Major League Baseball. The techniques I use for scheduling college basketball, college football, and when I say AI in this talk, generally I'm referring to uh, myself and my co-authors, George Nemhauser from Georgia Tech and Kelly Easton, who works for us at Sports Scheduling Group. And so when we work on these things, there's a huge different things we could do. So what we do with college basketball is different than what we do with Major League Baseball umpires, another group we schedule. And the neat thing from a research point of view, and why this is so relevant to mathematics is, uh, today, is small problems are going to be hard. I'm going to show you, uh, by approximately 20 minutes after the hour, a problem that nobody knows the answer to, and it fits on one slide. Okay? We don't, computationally, we have no idea how to get the optimal solution to this problem. And the best part is, the practical interest is right at this easy, hard interface. So we'd like to be able to solve problems with leagues of 12, 14, 16. And 12, 14, 16 is just in our grasp, or just out of our grasp, depending on how well we are doing. So this is an ideal time to be looking at these problems. And I will say, it's a lot more fun to talk about this sort of stuff than to talk about machine scheduling, with all due apologies to the machine schedulers in the crowd. So, let me say a few words about operations research. Raise your hand if you know what operations research is. Excellent. Uh, okay, well, not everybody. So, um, let me tell you, well, what is operations research? Well, 
Okay, the predominant uh, answer was, ah, geez, I don't know. I, I, I'm glad there was Coke and, and cookies out there, but I, I have no idea what this OR stuff is. Well, operations research is simply the analysis and optimization of business decisions using mathematical models. It is using mathematics to make better decisions. Now, for those of you who know about operations research, you might think, that's the thing that helped the Allies win World War II. And it did. And hence, sometimes you might think, geez, how relevant is this today? Um, or you might think that operations research is a bunch of notation. It is the ability to throw around more subscripts than anybody else. Um, and that's not what operations research about, is about. When you think operations research, you should be thinking companies like Google and Amazon. Both of these companies are founded on making decisions better, whether the decision is what web page to show when you go for a search or what books you might like based on your past reading uh, habits. That is, those are examples of operations research problems. FedEx is an operations research company that happens to ship packages. They do not make any decisions without having an underlying mathematical model to guide them in their decisions. So when you think operations research, you should be thinking competitive advantage, business opportunities, and fundamentally, how do you take the gigabytes and gigabytes of data that are generated every second and make better decisions? And I also want you to think of companies like Major League Baseball or groups such as Major League Baseball because they too are affected by operations research. Okay, and in fact, this is a great time for operations research. We get more data, we get faster computers, we get better algorithms. Just an example of this is 1996. Okay, so we're not talking ancient history like when I was doing a postdoc. Okay, in 1996, I, I was an associate professor, for goodness sake, and we solved linear programs five million times faster than we did in 1996. Okay, now that is not hyperbole. F computers are 5,000 times faster, and the algorithms are 1,000 times faster. You can multiply those together to get five million. What that means is stuff that took me a month in 1996, now take a few seconds, and that's assuming I didn't get any better, okay? And I did get better at this stuff, okay? And so we are able to address problems an order of magnitude larger than we did before. Okay, let's talk about Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball uh, has got 30 teams in two leagues, the American League and the National League. Uh, if we were organized like Europeans, we would have an East League and a West League and a, or a North League and a South League. We do not. The two leagues are spread throughout the United States and a little bit of Canada. Uh, each team plays 162 games over a 182-day season. I don't know of another sport that plays as many games with as few days off as Major League Baseball. Uh, the, they just are always, always playing. Now, we don't have to think of a schedule in terms of 162 games. Generally, teams play two series in a week. They'll play a series during the week, and they'll play a series on the weekend. So you can really think of this as 52 series per team over um, uh, 30 t teams. Okay, what makes a good schedule? Well, I'll show you a pretty good schedule. <laughs> Oops, hold on. Uh, oh, and just to point out uh, how everything is spread out, there are some geographic things that you can immediately see here. Minneapolis is not particularly far west relative to how the western teams. And so we have some west coast teams, we have Denver in the center, we've got some middle teams, and we've got the east coast. Okay, let's look at a schedule. Anybody recognize the schedule? Yeah, this is the 2009 twin schedule. I say it is a pretty good schedule because this is done by my group. And so uh, I like it. But as we look at this schedule, so let me just explain uh, some of the coding here. Uh, in blue, I have marked the home games. Uh, the white ones are the away games. 
We are seeing April and May, and we're not going to worry about start times of games. Now, first thing to note is how crowded everything is. There are, whoops, there are some weeks where a team would get two days off, but most weeks the team gets either one day off or no, no days off. So it is a crowded schedule. Now, if we go through the schedule, the Twins will begin this year at home against Seattle, and then they'll go to Chicago for three games, and then come home for a week, and then go to Boston and Cleveland, home to Tampa Bay and Kansas City, away to Detroit and Baltimore, home to Seattle and Detroit, away to New York and Chicago, and so on. If I go to the next months, we have June, July up at the top, and here we have a West Coast trip to Seattle, to Oakland, to Chicago. Here we have another uh, West Coast trip to Texas, to Oakland, to Anaheim, and so on. Now as we look, and now I'm just going to go back to April and May, as we look at this, we can see a few things going on. One, for the most part, we have an awful lot of one week at home, one week away. That is typically the best thing to do. Have one week at home, one week away. Now, not everybody can always do one week at home, one week away, because they have to play each other. And so if you had teams starting, both starting at home for a week, followed by away for a week, followed by home for the week, they'd never get to play each other. And so we use things like single series at Chicago, or uh, groups of three series to get teams out of step with each other so that they can play with each other. But this is a hard combinatorial problem. How do you get the teams out of step enough so that they can play the right number of games? Now, another thing to notice is that the travel is not uh, completely absurd. Now, this is the thing that the teams argue about the most, and correctly so. We know for every team what the minimum amount of travel it is for that team, and it differs. The minimum amount of tra travel for Chicago is a lot less than the minimum amount of travel for Seattle. We'd love to get every team playing their minimum amount of travel. We can't do it, okay? Uh, mathematically, it's impossible. We can prove that it's impossible, okay? We could show computationally, at least, that it's impossible. Now, that said, we want to have reasonable travel. And reasonable travel typically means not, not a lot of coast to coast and coast to coast stuff. So for the twins, a terrible schedule would be something like going to uh, Los Angeles, New York, Oakland. Okay, a schedule like that, even having one of those would probably be enough to disqualify a schedule. Okay. Um, if you look a little more carefully at this, you can see lots and lots of other things. If you look at the weekends, you will never find three weekends away or three weekends at home consecutively. That's something they care very much about on the weekends. So you, we will have two in a row. We should never have three in a row. And I realize I didn't look at the schedule, so I hope we don't have it. I don't think we do. So there are two primary drivers to schedule quality. One is the distance traveled, and the other is the flow. Now, the distance is, it's not cost, primarily. It's mainly wear and tear on the teams. You just don't want to tire them out by flying them all around the country. Remember, they have very few days off. And so, so many of these long trips, they will do after a game, before a game the next day. Flow, ideal is two home, two away, two home, uh, two away. Three is okay, one is possible, four is definitely avoided. They don't like the idea of having a team away for two weeks or home for two weeks. If you look at how this combines, this is Pittsburgh travel in 2008, and I, uh, so Pittsburgh's kind of right over in that spot. I've drawn the stuff from Pittsburgh in a thin line. The stuff in between is the travel from t city to city. And as you can see, it doesn't look all that short. Um, and that is primarily because uh, it is just very difficult to get travel down to the minimum amount. So, you know, having an Atlanta-Miami trip is a good one. Some of these longer trips, though, are the things we'd like to be avoiding. 
Now, there's a lot of other aspects that go in. In fact, what happens is Major League Baseball teams will fill out a long questionnaire, and then typically they will write us a letter saying how we messed up last year and could we please do better uh, to varying degrees of politeness. Um, and so there's a lot more stuff, though, that goes in. So you have to have half the weekends at home. Okay? There are 26 weekends, half, 13 have to be at home, or you do not have a valid schedule. Summer weekends. It turns out that the definition of summer changes depending on where you are because it depends on when school gets out locally. So uh, I know when everybody gets out of school because I now know when the summers start and people, uh, teams do not want to have less than half the summer weekends at home. Once in a while you get stadium unavailability, but we're going to see in a little bit that um, baseball schedules very early. And so for the most part, we have stadium availability. We're going to see in our, uh, the final part of this, uh, sometimes that's not quite the case. Uh, required open finish, some teams need to start at home. Cincinnati is one that's famous for always starting at home. And finally, no repeaters. You will never see Minnesota play the White Sox, followed immediately by the White Sox at Minnesota. Okay, that just, that's a called a repeater. Never happens. You got them, it's an illegal schedule. And then there's a lot of other things, uh, holiday requests. Some teams love to be at home on the 4th of July. Some teams hate being at home on the 4th of July. It all depends on what else is going on. Pretty well every team hates being at home on Mother's Day. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. I think going out to a Mother's Day game seems like a nice thing. Okay, but typically they don't particularly like Mother's Day. Um, Semi-repeaters. This is actually, this happens quite a bit when a team plays like Minnesota at the White Sox one weekend, followed by the White Sox at Minnesota the next weekend. Okay, now that happens quite a bit, but Henry and Holly's schedule had a ton of these. This is what Henry and, this is why I believe there's a lot of hand scheduling. That was their fundamental building block, is they put in all these semi-repeaters to schedule most of the games. Their brilliance was their ability to fill in after that, okay? Um, uh, preferred summer matchups, preferred open finish. Conflicts in two team cities. Um, Chicago has got two teams, the White Sox and the Cubs. They don't want them both at home. Why? It's not the fans. It's really not the TV. It is the Police doing the traffic, it is the beer vendors, it is everybody doing all the support, okay? Everybody doing the support works both of the stadiums, or a number of them do, and so that makes it very difficult if the two teams are at home at the same time. Okay, uh, just to give you an idea for the, of the timing, for 2008, we start in January 2007. Um, so we are currently working on the 2010 schedule. We have our first draft now ready, okay, uh, 2010. And so first thing that tells you is we don't do anything special with the World Series champion because we've got no idea who's going to win the World Series this year, okay? They didn't put it on the forums. I don't know who's going to win this year. So um, we, no idea. And so most of the work is done in the spring. Over the summer, the teams receive the tentative schedule, provide feedback. August, the schedule is given to the Players Association, and by the end of August, the schedule is fixed. So schedule is fixed for the following year without knowing how the one year finishes. In fact, the schedule never has anything to do with the, val the um, strength of teams. Now, I'm going to go back to the schedule, and I'm going to point out one thing. If the Twins are in a divisional matchup, uh, and, and, or they, they're trying to win their division, then you will, and it's a close race, you're going to get articles in the newspaper that say, those schedulers were brilliant. How did they know that the Twins would be, say, fighting Kansas City for the, championship, uh, the, the, the divisional championship? And look at that. We've got three games against Kansas City there, and uh, it's cut off here, three games against Kansas City there. They scheduled six games. They had to know that it was Kansas City against the Twins. No. So who else might it be? It might be Detroit. Geez, I got three games there, and I've got three games there. I've got six games against Detroit. 
Um, do you see a pattern here? You play home and away against your division in September. I don't care who is in the division, in, uh, who is fighting for a divisional championship, you will see them twice in September. Okay, that's part of the format of the schedule. Okay, so. Now, what you've seen is actually more than half the work in practice. Part, uh, a big part of operations research is understanding the problem. Okay, and it took a long time to understand the problem, and I never could have understood the problem except for Doug Veerman. Doug knows baseball, he can explain things to me. Um, but now we get to what operations research is good at, modeling and solving problems. Now, the key structure I'm going to be working with is a round robin schedule. So a round robin is where you pick some subset of teams. So you might pick the league, you might pick some divisions, and you say, okay, you're now going to play a round robin. So here is a round robin of 10 teams, okay? And my colleagues in discrete or combinatorial mathematics know a number of ways to get me round robin schedules. So here, if you go through, you see that everybody plays everybody else. If you have n teams, then it takes n minus one rounds to do that. Now, if I could go back to 1996, I would love it. In 1996, the, the format of the schedule was essentially, you played a double round robin amongst all teams in your league, and then you played another double round robin against all teams in your league. Okay, and I'd love to get back to scheduling that. I, I, I'm really good at trying to schedule things like that. Um, 2003, we had a hypothetical schedule that had a double round robin amongst all the teams, followed by a single round robin, followed by divisional round robins. Currently, our schedule, our schedule at its basis looks like a, double, a divisional double round robin followed by a league double round robin followed by a divisional double round robin. That's why September has the two matchups. Now it's complicated because not all the divisions are the same size and we've got to squeeze in some interleague play, okay? But as its basic form, that is what our schedule looks like. And that's good, okay? It's nice to have this because I can explain to people what the schedule looks like. It's not a mess. It's not like team, uh, uh, teams are just playing at random. There is some structure and that's a good thing. It's also good because I now can take the huge combinatorial, um, uh, combinatorial design literature and use that to help me generate tournaments of particular forms. And it also means that I have good separation between consecutive visits. If you look at when the twins are going to play their divisional rivals, almost invariably they'll be one in April or early May, one around June, July, and one in very late August or early September. It's good separation. You do not want to play all your divisional rivals very early in the season or very late in the season. Now, of course, the bad things are, once I force round robins to go in a particular way, I'm forcing a particular structure. And now if I want to minimize travel, say, by putting on this structure, I've naturally increased travel, okay? And this is one of the fundamental precepts of operations research. If you add a constraint, the, schedule, the solution cannot get better, okay? Now, it can get better on, on some measures, but if your objective is to minimize travel, adding a constraint like have these round robins will not do that, okay? At the end, this is actually about the only way I know how to schedule. I know how to schedule round robins. This is the way we do it. Okay, now, let me tell you what doesn't work. Routine operations research does not work on this problem. Um, and so, straightforward integer programming doesn't work, greedy heuristics don't work, local search doesn't work. Essentially, everything I knew when I was a postdoc here doesn't work. Let me explain about this a little bit. First, let me tell you about how operations research works. Operations research works by creating models of problems. And for us, a model consists of three main pieces. The decisions to be made, which are, will be represented as unknowns, mathematical unknowns, X, Y. 
the objective function to be maximized or minimized relative to these, and any constraints we have on those decisions. Okay, so the result of this is a formulation. So we have variables, objective constraints. Once I create a model, my work is primarily done because I'm going to create models with enough restrictions that I will then give it to a computer program and say, this model is now in the right form, find the solution. Now, the heart of this is to create models that the software is likely to find the solution in a reasonable amount of time. Depending on the form of the variables, objectives, and constraints, the likelihood I'm going to get an answer it, uh, will be affected by that. So if I have a linear uh, objective, 4x1 plus 3x2, minimize it. And I have linear constraints, 6x plus 5y, less than or equal to 12. And I have continuous variables, which means I don't mind a solution like 6 and a half for x. Then I've got what's known as a linear program, and I am in great shape. If I have a linear program, with a million variables and 500,000 constraints, I don't worry. The software is strong enough that that will give me a solution in a reasonable amount of time. So if I could formulate a problem as a linear program, I'm fine. But I might have to have my variables be discrete. I need them to take on integer values. I don't want six and a half. I'm producing television sets. I either produce six TVs or seven TVs. Or, more directly, I'm scheduling games. New York either plays Minnesota or does not play Minnesota. That's a discrete decision. And because of that, I have to go to integer programming. It gets even harder if I then add any nonlinear constraints or nonlinear objective. And so my life is a linear life. I live life with linear objective and linear constraints because I never want to get into the worst situation. There's a workshop here a little while ago of a bunch of crazy people who think they can solve that. I look forward to seeing what they're doing uh, 20 years from now. I bet you they're doing great stuff. But right now, that's too hard for me. So I live in the world of linear objective, linear constraints, and integer variables. Now, so here we need integer programming because my decisions are either uh, to play a game or not. At that point, essentially everything I can do is um, I, I can uh, fix within this linear structure. Now, the natural set of decisions to make would be binary decisions, yes, no decisions. X, I, J, T would be one if I plays at J in time slot T. Okay, and from that set of variables, we can try to get our constraints. Only one game per slot essentially says if you take the sum over all j, x, i, j, t um, equal, uh, equals one. That would force one game per slot. Visit the correct number of times and so on. All of these can be put in as linear constraints. If you do this, you have a few problems. One, it's hard to formulate the distances. Knowing you play one game here doesn't tell you how far you have to travel to the next game. And in order to avoid a nonlinear um, uh, formulation, you have to add more variables. The result is a mess. You die a horrible death if you try to formulate the problem this way. In fact, oh, Oh my goodness, that was the whole talk. <laughs> to date, that formulation, the best we can solve is a four-team round robin. We can't even do a six-team round robin. Okay, and so we are so far away, we can't do that. Okay, so this is my first failure back in 1996. The integer programs don't solve. My next approach was to say, okay, look, why don't, instead of finding best solutions, I'm trying to compete against Henry and Holly. Let me just try to find good solutions. Now, good solutions 
are, revolve around heuristics. These are approaches that find good but not necessarily optimal solution. So I could perhaps just greedily try to find round robins. It's hard to do that, actually, even ignoring distances home away and so on. So for instance, 10 teams. If I asked you to write down a 10-team round robin schedule, chances are pretty good you would fail, unless you knew some combinatorial mathematics. Okay, because what you do is you'd start putting down, okay, slot one will have one against two, three against four, and so on. Slot two, one against four, two against three, slot three, slot four, slot five. And then you get to slot six, and we try to schedule slot six, and we've got one against three, two against four, five against seven, six against eight. Well, I've got nine against ten. The problem with that is I've, nine's already played ten. Round robin, they play once. Hmm. Maybe I messed up on slot six. Actually, no, I, had to, I messed up earlier. Trying to figure out where I messed up earlier is hard. How do I know I can't schedule slot six? I can bring in graph theory. Graph theory will give me guidance into how I can schedule a slot. Here, I've drawn a graph where I've got a node, a circle uh, for every team, and I've got an edge if they still need to play each other. Once I draw that diagram, we see that 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9 have to play each other, and 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10 have got to play each other, but if you have, say, one against three and nine against seven, five's got to play somebody. But five has no edges leading to the other group. Because of that, there is no schedule here for slot six. So now we've got to backtrack, and life is a mess. So there's one other approach that works all the time. This is foolproof. I, it has to work, I said back in 1996. This is local search. What local search is, is a heuristic approach where you take a solution and you just try to improve it. So what you do is, here's a solution for six teams. And I might look at this and I say, uh, by the way, notice Montreal is still here. And so we're now talking work I was doing in the 1990s. Uh, if instead of having New York begin against uh, Pittsburgh, why don't I have New York begin against Philadelphia and see if that leads to a better schedule? Well, unfortunately, as soon as I do that, if I have New York against Philadelphia, um, then both Montreal and Pittsburgh have got to be changed. And so now maybe I have Montreal at Pittsburgh, but I already have a Montreal at Pittsburgh, so I got to change that. And I got to change and change and change. And in fact, I end up with a mess. The entire schedule changes as soon as I move one game. And this is the thing that makes sports scheduling hard. As soon as you try to make any little change, the whole schedule changes. And this really causes us problems. Because often leagues will come back and say, perfect schedule. Just please change this one game. It doesn't work. As soon as you change one game, everything gets messed up. OK, and this is where I was in 1996. I am dead, OK, because my three main ideas, integer programming, greediness, local search, none of them work. So it's taken me a while to figure out what does work. So you might have an idea. You might say, hey, what about? And so let me tell you, if you've got an idea on how to solve this problem, I got a challenge for you. OK, so if you, want, if you think that you can solve this stuff, here's what you can do. I've got a challenge set of problems out there called the traveling tournament problem. The traveling tournament problem abstracts out the key issues in Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball, rightly so, doesn't want me to give you all the constraints and all the requirements. And you don't want to do that. That's not the way research is done. But here, all I ask you to do is I'll give you a distance matrix. You find a double round robin tournament that minimizes travel such that there's no more than three in a row at home or uh, the word away should be there. Okay, and this is hard to do to optimality for even eight teams. Let me show you how this works. Uh, there are six teams from National League of uh, National League um, when Montreal was still in the National League. There's a distance matrix. Team one is 745 miles from team two. 
In 1999, Kelly Easton determined the optimal solution to this. Atlanta begins with three games at home, followed by at Philadelphia, at Montreal, at Pittsburgh, and so on. That schedule is 23,916 miles. Up until two months ago, this was the largest problem ever solved to optimality. There's an eight-team problem that has now been solved to optimality. Ten teams has not been solved to optimality. Okay, Ten-team double round robin, we cannot figure out how to find the minimum distance schedule. So if you've got your favorite approach, neural networks, uh, genetic algorithms, um, some sort of weird topological optimization approach, give it a try. Um, now, you might think that maybe this only looks hard because trick isn't very smart, which could well be, but in fact, there are the computational results for 12 teams. Okay, back in 2001, uh, Rottenberg and LeBert have found a distance of 143,655 miles. Over time, this has gone down and down to now 110,000 miles by uh, work by Pascal Van Hentenreich and his co-authors. Okay, lots of people have worked on it. Look at all the different names. Um, when it comes to the lower bound, knowing we can't do any better, currently we have a value of 107,494. That's the gap. We know the optimal solution is somewhere between 107,494 and 110,000. Lots of people have worked on it, and there's still a significant gap. Now, is this good news or bad news? Well, for somebody who tries to make a living at this, not a living, but at least uh, uh, doing the kitchen renovations, this is great news. Warren Buffett says, in businesses, I look for castles protected by unreachable moats. And that's a great line, because the computational difficulty of this is my moat. When baseball said, we don't really need you, we're going to do this ourselves, I was pretty confident they were going to have some problems. Okay, and not because they're not smart. They're really smart people there. However, this is a big moat. And um, even knowing everything in this talk is not enough to jump over that moat. Okay, and so I was pretty confident that that moat was going to cause them problems. So let me tell you what do, does work. There are some ideas from modern operations research that do work well here. Now, I'm just going to go through these very quickly, and I'm happy to talk to you about them after this. So um, the things that do work are to redefine the variables to contain much more structure. Second thing is large neighborhood search. And the third thing is a new method in uh, computer science called constraint programming. Redefinition of variables. As I said, if I choose my variables to be x, i, j, t, to be 1 if, j is set, if i is at j in time t, you die. It doesn't work. But that's not the only way to formulate it. That's the key idea. This is why OR people can be successful. We can think of different ways to formulate it. So instead, I'm going to have my variables correspond to each road trip. So instead of just a single series, I'm going to have an entire road trip as a variable. So I'm going to have a variable x1, which says that this team is at New York in period one, at Montreal in period two. Now, this is a great variable, because I can put a cost on it associated with the distance. If Doug Bierman doesn't like that trip, I can penalize it or get rid of it completely. And now I can add in all sorts of constraints, for instance, Something, uh, a team can only do one thing at a time, means you could do x1 or x2. The y variables correspond to staying at home, y1 or y2. Okay, that says do one thing in period two. You can't do a, a road trip followed by a road trip. You have to do a road trip followed by a homestand. So here, x2 plus x3 is no more than one. And finally, a constraint that says if team i is at j, at, in a time period, then j is at home in that time period. By putting more structure in my variables, I get something that's much, much better to solve. And in fact, now I can solve up to eight. Okay, this technique will solve eight. Okay, and it gets really good solutions, but not provably optimal, up to 16. So this is the first idea. Put more information in your variables. Get creative. 
The whole point of operations research is creativity in how you model and how you solve. The second idea is large-scale neighborhood search. I talked about exchanging pairs of games. Don't exchange pairs of games. Exchange lots of games, but keep where you exchange under control. You can think of this as follows. If I have a schedule, April, May, June, July, August, September, I could say, OK, I'm going to keep my May through September schedule. And now find me the best April schedule. Now, that's a much smaller problem. I can solve that to optimality. And now I can find the best May schedule and the best June schedule and so on. And now I could take half of April and half of June. Okay? All I need to do is take a schedule, relax a quarter of it, let me change a quarter of it, resolve, and repeat for days on end. When we create baseball schedules, we will let things run for a week or more, okay? doing this sort of local improvement. So this is a nice idea. It allows us to, again, fix, release, and try to get an improved part of this. Um, it allows us to take advantage of all the computing time we have. And this is, I think, one of the, the best ideas in operations research. Okay, this is a very powerful technique ac across a wide variety of problems. The third concept is constraint programming. Um, I am an integer programmer from way back. I love linear constraints. But constraint programming is an approach that says, what if you never, if you don't limit yourself to uh, linear problems, but allow much more complicated constraints? So this came from the computer science artificial intelligence world. And let me just give you a quick example here. Suppose I have my variables x, y, and z, and I tell you x can be either 1 or 2, y can be 2 or 3, and z can be, has to be 3. I can, within constraint programming, I can create a new constraint called all different. All different says x, y, and z have got to be all different. Okay, that's not a linear constraint. That's a weird constraint to me. But as soon as we have that constraint, if we program things up nicely, then it will deduce, the computer can deduce that y has to be 2, and once y is 2, x has to be 1. If you take these domains of the variables and this constraint, then the effect is everything comes down to unique values. OK, that's the heart of constraint programming. Nice thing is, lots of stuff in sports scheduling can be formulated nicely by constraint programming, all different simply says if you go down the time slots, a team has got to play all different teams in a round robin. So everything the constraint programmers know about all different is encapsulated in that constraint. And this turns out to be a very good approach for finding feasible solutions faster than integer programming. I'm a big believer in this idea. Uh, still having trouble finding optimal solutions. OK. If I put that all together, and I realized that I went through that, what I was really giving you were keywords, OK? Local search, variable redefinition, and constraint programming, OK? And there's a lot of literature out there. Our approach uses more complicated variables, up to and including a variable for a full schedule of a team. As you can imagine, there's a lot of such variables, but now the formulation is very simple. Large-scale local search, constraint programming, and then if I really wanted to nerd out here, I'd tell you about Bender's Cuts, okay, which is a way of trying to uh, get information back uh, to communicate between phases. And the result is, well, one, it's not a simple model and solve approach. It's a very engineering approach to solving problems like this. Okay? I'm trying to create a system to meet a particular goal, a very engineering idea. OK, the result is generally good schedules very quickly, reasonably so. Major League Baseball takes us, I mean, we can't do it in a couple days, but if you give us a month, we can create reasonable schedules. And if you give us two or three months, we can create really good schedules. We have done work on college basketball scheduling. We've been the ACC scheduler since 1998. I guess until recently. I think they're trying somebody else this year. Umpire scheduling. Um, 
these ideas and similar ideas have been working pretty broadly. Okay, so that is kind of a whirlwind tour of the sort of things we've been doing. Let me close off by going back to my story. So there I am with my family. We're on the beach in New Zealand in a house we can no longer afford because Major League Baseball doesn't need us. Well, a little while later, we get a phone call. Um, we're having a few problems. Could you help us out? We're big baseball fans. Of course we can help you out. And we got the signed contract, and we then began to help them out. Uh, now, because uh, we were a little compressed in time, the schedule wasn't quite as good as we'd like it. It was still a pretty good schedule. Okay, it was better than what we had provided two years earlier because our techniques are better. Okay, but um, not as good as perhaps we'll be providing this year. And so we got feedback. And so first, the owners said, you know, we're having some troubles with this schedule. Those aren't the real owners. That's the American League in 1911. And many of these people are no longer alive. Okay, and so, um, and they said, okay, well, you know, we're having some trouble. And we made a few changes where we could. But for the most part, we had done our best to try to meet the team requirements. And then Bud Selig, commissioner of baseball, said, you know, I got some problems with the schedule. Could you do this and this? Well, Bud signs our paycheck. And so naturally, we're very happy to try to help Bud out. And so we changed around a little bit more so that we met his requirements. And I thought we were done. And then we got a call. Barack Obama and John McCain don't like our schedule. Well, I know President Obama, uh, now president, not then, um, uh, is a sports fan, but you know, I, I really didn't expect to get feedback from him. Well, of course, it turns out that last year, 2008, there were the national conventions, the Republicans here and the Democrats in Denver. Well, we had scheduled some games <laughs> during the conventions, and that's a problem. As you know, every hotel room from here to Fargo was taken up during the national convention. There was no way you could play a baseball game. And so we had to change around in order to meet the requirements of the Republicans and the Democrats. And so I thought we were done. The Pope doesn't like your schedule. <laughs> the Pope. How did the Pope come into this? Well, it turns out that the Pope is coming to visit New York. We either didn't know or didn't put in. In any case, there are two stadiums in New York. There's Yankee Stadium and Shea Stadium. In effect, we had the Pope at Shea Stadium. We were told the Pope plays Yankee Stadium. Um, well. The Yankees are in Yankee Stadium. Um, does the Pope want to throw out the first pitch? Well, they told me I could, well, um, in any case, um, we decided that the best thing to do was to change our schedule around a little bit. And so, in fact, uh, here's the news from the New York Times. Pope to visit Ground Zero and celebrate Mass at Yankee Stadium due to the efforts of the sports scheduling group as we changed things around so he could be in Yankee Stadium. Once we did that, I'm afraid I do not top the Pope. That gave us our official 2008 schedule, uh, which they played. Um, so that's the story. Things I'd like you to take away from this um, and so all the high school kids are now rapidly uh, uh, scribbling down these takeaways, which is a good thing to do. These are good ideas. Uh, new methods, faster computers, more data is making operations research more relevant. And this is great news, okay, because the sort of mathematics that we're doing is, being, is more and more relevant to business, to society every day. Um, if you'd like to try this, I do encourage you to look at this, pro this problem. And just see if you have some ideas on how to solve it. Um, all of us are blind, uh, blinded by our past. I have a certain set of tools, and I will pound away with those tools on this problem. And I do think that a, a creative new look at this would be a good thing to do. Um, I would say that operations research really is changing sports. Um, it is making things more efficient. It is allowing a, a, a more complicated set of constraints. 
Um, but it's not always about the methods. Okay, a lot of it is about trying to understand what the customer, in this case Major League Baseball, really needs and try to provide um, solutions that match up to their needs. So, on that note, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure that Mike would be happy to answer a couple of questions. Any questions? Okay, so the question is, have the schedules gotten better? And I think um, in general they have not. Uh, there was a nice quote in today's um, university paper, uh, which had the general manager of the Twins saying the schedules I, he thinks are getting worse. And I think he's correct. And the reason they're getting worse, in, and we see this in every league, once we get a success, they add more things for us to, report, to do. So they add more constraints. So if you worry about travel distance, they've added more constraints, and so travel distance has naturally gone up. Yep. Other questions? It's difficult to say, though. Teams move around. Uh, they change um, uh, how many times uh, they move away from the balance to the unbalanced and so on. OK, other questions? Okay. Yes? Has the baseball league talked to you at all about possible changes to their current format of how many times each team plays each team? Uh, part of what we are able to do is provide mock-up schedules in such a position. And so they may ask for it periodically, uh, and we would provide that to provide feedback on what things would look like at the, in situations like that. Okay, I certainly have no inside information, though, on what they would or would not consider. Yes? Do you consider uh, weather in uh, northern climates for early opening? Um, and so one of the, uh, the question is, do we worry about the weather in northern climates? Uh, a place like here is a good place to do an early April game because you've got a dome. Uh, in fact, un under the current scheduling, we do not worry about it. We do not have a so-called southern open. Um, and it's something that we could do if baseball wanted, but uh, that's not a, uh, uh, a request that they Okay, um, I think on that note.